Uh, so with that, I'm going to move to our last agenda item, which is Governor Roundtable. Um, and I think the purpose of Governor Roundtable is to raise issues, make comments that are not otherwise on the agenda, which is a, a, perhaps a creation of the OPMA, but uh, still probably, possibly, probably a good idea. I think there are a couple governors who uh, indicated earlier today that they did want to make, uh, bring up other issues. So I invite the governors to uh, talk about any issue not on the agenda that uh, they would like to address. And I see Governor Peterson's hand first. Yeah, I just, um, you know, we've talked about it a couple times. I just don't want it to fall through the cracks, but I think um, making the wellness program more robust and, um, you know, taking some of those recommendations that were given to us I can't remember if it was the last BOG meeting or the BOG meeting before, but I think um, what was suggested and the, the need there is truly real. And it's, um, it's something I think we need to, personally, I think we need to address and we need to rectify it. But I mean, that's obviously up to the board of governors, but I just, um, I'm just, I'm just speaking up now because I just don't want that to fall through the cracks. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you, that is a priority in my, I see you, Dan, um, Governor Clark. Uh, it is a priority on my uh, list as well. Um, know that uh, Dr. Um, Dan Crystal, who is came and shared with us in January, he is currently working on that as well. We should have a proposal probably in April uh, to further build that program because I agree 100% with you, Governor Peterson. It's, it's very important and well overdue. And uh, I'm hoping with uh, Treasurer Clark's uh, input that we're going to be able to improve that program immediately and then significantly over the course of the next few years. So um, yeah, I don't think we've forgotten about that in any way. Governor Higgins, uh, uh, Governor Clark, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, that, that was my point. I mean, yeah, with that and that we had, uh, I mean, we can have that on now. It was my understanding they were going to, going to yeah, I mean, I mean I, I'm wait with that, but, but, but yeah. yeah, so thank you. You bet. Yeah, let's uh, tune in in April and uh, there will be more discussion. Governor Higginson. I have, I have a few things. And the first thing though that I wanted to throw out is round table to me says that we actually throw things out and then we talk about them. I don't just blurt out a bunch of stuff and everybody says, okay, and we move on. So is that your understanding of a round table so that we each can pitch out something that we have on our mind and other people can react and comment on it? Yeah, the round table is a little fuzzy. So if you wanna engage in a discussion, I'll entertain that. Okay. So some are just questions actually and issues that, that I just wanted to kind of touch base on. One is, uh, this is more uh, in Julie's bailiwick, is codifying the, the um, policies that we have, she, uh, that we've, we as a board over the years have done. I know that's something that um, we've talked about a few times and we've gotten some information and I appreciate that, but I still think it would be super helpful for us to have the policies um, actually collected. I say codified, but somehow collected by topic so that we can find them easily and we and, and future governors uh, could use them. So I was wondering if I could find out if anyone else thinks that's important and if it is, how can we move that project forward? So I think Executive Director Nevitt, um already took a look and tried to put all of the policies that she knew about together. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. I, so I, I'm happy to improve what we've done or expand on what we've done. I just want to know specifically what the need is. So whether it's here or outside the meeting, because we have compiled them by subject area, sent them out in a PDF. Um, but if it's, if that's not the right format, um, I do remember last time we talked about this, um, I think you had expressed an interest in like the historical versions of the policies, which I have not done. Um, we can do that. 
again, I'm going to hearken a little bit back to my <laughs> discussion about the technology committee. It would be a big project. We can definitely do it. It's just we have to know that that's where we want to put our resources. And that would probably fall to Julie's team, which is uh, often our bottleneck on a lot of things because they're very busy. <laughs> Well, and that's why I ask if, it, if this is not important to anybody else, I'm, I'll, I'll drop this topic, but I've been bringing it up for about a year now. Just from, for me, it would be really helpful because I like to see when a policy first came into play, when it was, how it was modified over the years. It helps inform me when I'm trying to decide, is there a reason to modify a policy or, and frankly, what are our policies? Because I don't think anybody really knows what the policies all are that the board has, this board has passed from time to time, um, unless you're an unusual person and has taken the time to look at, look them all over. So that's why I wondered if other people, you know, I'd like to know what other people think. Is it, is it a topic that we should, an issue that we should um, ask uh, you, Tara, to allocate staff resources to or not? So. Right. And there, and there may be a, a component of um, budgeting on that too. If we have to have staff devoted to that, there may be a budget proposal. Governor Williams Ruth. I think that this would be fantastic and I would like it to include resolutions. So that way, like earlier in our conversation of this two day meeting, we had a conversation about how, oh, there was a resolution that the board passed blank, you know, it, it, it's, you know, the, the one resolution we seem to always keep hearing because it's literally mentioned at every single meeting I've been to for the last year is the, you know, the Reggie commitments that were signed on to by the Board of Governors in tw May of 2018. It's like drilled into my head. But I don't know any other resolutions that are out there that still are like the opinion. So I, I personally believe that this creating an appropriately uh, and, I, and I say this having seen what the governor's office did with COVID, where every time there was a new proclamation for the governor's special powers, that there it was just on there. It's like proclamation 20-50.1, which happens to relate to homeowners associations. Then it was 50.1.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0 0.4. And every time it got modified. And so it was in a centralized place. And I And yes, trying to go back and create records is going to be a staff time, but I, for one, do support that because, you know, if if we're going to be, if, if I wanted to create a resolution regarding something only to find out that, you know what, the Board of Governors did it in 2015, then instead of needing to rehash the wheel, it's like, look, we need to stand by what we said as the Washington State Bar Association in 2015. So, yes, I, I think that is a good use of time for our policies, um, for our resolutions, Anything that will then, you know, be used for today, so it's not the recreation of the wheel, and you know, because it's it's where I spend a lot of time talking with the executive staff is learning about things that I don't know that I don't even know that's out there, and thank goodness we have such great, you know, institutional knowledge and and memory of certain people, but then what happens when they're no longer so. Okay. Uh, thank you, Governor Williams Ruth. If you want to talk on this subject, why don't you uh, hold up your hand so I can distinguish from people who want to talk on other subjects? I've got Dan Clark and Governor Peterson. Any other hands? All right. And uh, I might suggest that, uh, well, I'll hold off on my suggestion. Go ahead, Governor Clark. Well, um, I, 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 okay, well, sure, Kyle, thank you. Okay, I've thought for a while that it makes sense that we explore having, I, I, I know we have Jim, I mean, that's that's sort of one, and, and but to have, a, a, you know, a, um, a spot, you know, for the bog where, okay, well, we have somebody who has, you know, I, I mean, that, I, I, you know, that, I, that standpoint that can say what happened. You know, you know, so it's sort of like a, I, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, with that. So, yeah. Thank you, Governor Clark. Governor Peterson. Yeah, I don't have a strong view about this. I guess my initial reaction to it is, um, yeah, it would be nice to have a central location for all, you know, current policies and resolutions. I, I guess I'm, I'm questioning in my mind, and I don't know the answer if the cost benefit analysis makes sense to 
there go, you know, put the histories like, oh, well, here's the histories of this policy for the last 50 years, right? I'm not, I mean, if you're looking to change a policy and, and, and maybe you want the history to kind of see it to what you might want to do in the future, maybe that makes sense. But I guess just from a simple cost benefit analysis, I'm just questioning my mind, the utility of that. I could be wrong. Like I said, I, I, I'm, this is kind of thinking on the fly. Thank you. Governor Peterson, you're reading my mind. My suggestion was going to be, you know, have uh, Executive Director Nevitt uh, maybe quantify this a little bit. I'm later today when we get out, I'm going to be going up to the upper floors to take a look at past uh, editions of the bar news going back to 1947. And so I imagine that uh, there is a history there that even in those uh, editions that would influence policies that are no longer in use um, that we'll probably never see. So certainly we don't probably need to go back to 1947 to recreate a history of a policy that's long gone. So maybe, maybe what we can do is with executive director of its help is to figure out the existing policies that were, are govern, gov, governing us, the things that she's already pulled together, and then see what it would take to put a history um, together. And, uh, you know, I spent a year with the Code Revisor's Office, and I know codification of, uh, of statutes is complicated. It's not, it's not easy. Um, so trying to figure out what amendments were when and how they were done on the fly could be um, tricky, but we don't know that yet. So perhaps um, uh, executive director can do the, the preliminary work on that. And then if it does become something that's going to be very uh, intricate and uh, we'll need to have staff uh, allocated to it, then I imagine there'll be a budget um, analysis done to suggest how much that's going to cost and then we can weigh it that way that's that that would be my suggestion um governor grubicki were you, you going to comment on this particular issue okay yes and, and before you do executive director nevitt do you want to jump in quick first i can go after governor grubicki all right governor grubicki um first of all i'm really surprised that um we don't already have all of that in um, some sort of a set of organized files. Um, th that, that surprises me. Even in our law firm, we have things organized that well. <laughs> um, and I, I fight about overhead all the time. You know, it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong or naive, but it seems to me that you could hire um, a, um, a, a 1L law student during the summer to undertake this project um, and get an awful lot done for you know 20 bucks an hour um, without having to burden uh, the current staff too much. Everyone, you know, the kid would have to come and ask questions, but a, a, a smart young 1L um, to me ought to be able to get this accomplished and make, you know, it may take more than just the summer, but that, that'd be the approach I'd try first. Good suggestion. Executive Director Nevin. Yeah. So I wanted to say a couple of things I just wanted to clarify and then suggest a, what's essentially similar to what you said, President Shkedi. One is that, uh, Governor Gravicki, I am also surprised. <laughs> and Governor Higginson, I, you know, I, I also, I mean, I think this is a great, important project. This is an organization that historically, for whatever reason, we don't have very centralized information about some of these governance things. Now, there, there are areas of the organization that are incredibly well organized. Those are primarily our regulatory <laughs> areas. Um, but when it comes to governance, I don't, I don't know why we haven't had this sort of all in a very clear way. Um, one thing I wanna be clear about, every single BOG policy you have, so there's no policies missing as far as we know. We have done the work. It's been like a five-year slog in bits and pieces. You know, Julie ran with the baton for a few years. Anna picked it up and finished it. So I, I'm, I think I'm as confident as we can be that every current board approved policy you have. The resolutions that Governor Williams Ruth mentioned, I think we could probably do that relatively relatively quickly and um, it's I mean I I think um but in terms of more of a you know 
really understanding, I guess, the legislative history of every policy, that is where I think that is a bigger project. If we put it on existing staff, it's not that it can't get done, but it might take five or six years like the other one did. And so I do like the idea of maybe hiring somebody or contracting with someone to just get the project done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Executive Director Nevitt. Uh, I have uh, two hands up, Governor Williams Ruth and Governor Grabicki. Are, are, is, this, is this on topics? Um, no. Okay, so let's go back to Governor Higginson. Oh, thank you. Um, so, thank, and thank you all for that discussion. I, that, I found that useful. Um, and I'm just going to only say in response to Brian's point about cost benefit analysis um, that we, we do, we never, we, this is a good time to take a look at something like that with the budget process starting up again. So that could be a use, this could be a useful thing to consider as budget and it begins our process. Um, anyway, the, the next thing that I wanted to bring up was ma box materials and the difficulties with that. Um, that. That program I find difficult to use and a bit problematic, but, but more importantly, and probably worse from, from my standpoint, and I brought this up before over the last couple of years, I, I don't know why we can't download from Box. Um, it, it's very hard. I mean, I, maybe the rest of you only use computers, but I still tend to also like to look at a printed document when I'm reviewing something. I can make my comments. I can take it with me you know, to, um, uh, well, I don't really go anywhere any for meetings anymore, but um, you know, you can, you can take it home if you want to spend some time reviewing it and so forth. And, and as you all know, it's a lot of materials we just can't print. And, and I don't know why. And I'm wondering whether others would like to see us change that policy, the informal policy that we can't print things from box to allow us to print. I'm, I'm given to understand, but I'm sure Tara Julie can tell me that that's just a function of when it's posted, there's some code that's added that says, no, you can't download it. Um, I don't, if that's true, can it be just posted so that we as governors can download them and print them? I mean, we are governors, we, we ought to be able to um, be trusted with not losing our materials or leaving them out so that somebody randomly can find them. So. I just wonder what other people think, because I really would like to, to be able to download materials from Box and print them when I want to. All right. If anybody has any comments on that, uh, raise your hand and I will distinguish between. So Executive Director Nevitt, anybody else? So just for my own personal observation, I am also a paper person and sometimes it gets me in trouble um, as you get too much paper. And so I like to review things too, but I understood that that was more of a security issue than anything else. Executive Director Nevin. So, and I'll look to Julie and Shelly. It's not, I'm not aware that we have a policy that we don't want you to download or print the materials. I think occasionally there have been things that were so sensitive that we've made that choice, but I didn't think we were routinely, and you're right, what happens is we upload the materials and we can put certain restrictions on them. Um, the main purpose of Box from my perspective is that we have a secure way to share documents because we all know email is not particularly secure. Um, so that's how we share confidential documents. It's not, it, it may be that we just need to talk and be aligned because I don't, I don't know. And Julie, correct me if I'm wrong and Shelly, let me know, but I don't, I don't, I'm not aware that it's our policy to say you can never print those materials. I think there have been a few instances, but for the most part, I didn't think that was our default position. So um, is it possible that we could make the default that we can download them and print them? Because it seems and maybe I've just randomly picked things <laughs> that have been locked, but um, it seems like the things that I really want to study, I, I can't, I can't download and then I, and I can't print. You know, Councilor Shanklin? It's my perception that there is no policy and that the default is that you can print things. Um, so if you can tell me which things it is that you can't print, I, we can go back and figure out, you know, maybe the permissions are set incorrectly. 
usually it's the confidential materials, what's called confidential materials for our meetings. Okay, that's not something I post, I don't think. But we can fix that. I think we can fix that. I see Shelly smiling and waving. <laughs> I see. Oh, Alec is waving too. I see Governor <laughs> Governor Stevens. Governor Stevens, do you have a thought? I don't have a thought. I have an experience. I don't know, but that maybe Governor Higginson, you need some technical assistance. And I say that only because I was able to download both the Epiphany uh, piece and the uh, memo today. I downloaded it as a PDF. And I now have it in my file so I can go back and review it without having to always go into box. So I, I haven't had that, that experience. Let me just tell you, I, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you, but you know, maybe it's the, the approach that you took and maybe Shelly or somebody can work with you so that you can also have the experience of doing it. Uh, it, it may be a little tricky and it is a little tricky, but you know, I've, you know, I've gotten into a habit and a routine and I know how to get it from box to an, a, to a PDF in Adobe. And then once I have it as a PDF, then I can save it to my files. So that's, that's the process I've used. And Governor well, Knight. That's great. Uh, thank you, President Shikhetti. I think just to follow up on Governor Stevens' comment and Governor Higginson's comment, it depends on the settings of how it was uploaded to Box. So uh, I, Governor Stevens is right that many of the documents in Box we can download. Governor Higginson is also right that there are some documents that were uploaded to Box that because of the settings of the person who uploaded it, we cannot download. I think Executive Director Nevitt alluded to earlier, we don't really have a policy of not allowing governors to download documents. Um, I think that policy would be a bad idea. I think we should express a level of trust of our governors to keep confidential material confidential. And quite frankly, I mean, I think tech savvy enough governors or at least their offices would be able to find a way to PDF it anyway and get it out of box somehow anyway, if you're reading it on a screen. So. You know, I think for those folks that would rather, you know, print it and, and read it, I don't have a problem with box. My preference is let's keep the settings to such an extent that allows those governors to that want to print it and can maintain the confidentiality, allow them to do that. I don't I don't see a reason that that's I don't see a reason that that shouldn't happen. I think one of the examples where this was particularly problematic was the executive director's contract. So that was uploaded with like extreme level security such that you know, there, was, there was no editing, no downloading, uh, no changing at all. And it was, a, it was a document that I think lent itself to a discussion of perhaps redlining or perhaps you know, editing. And that just wasn't possible through the way it was uploaded through Box. So um, I, I agree with both of uh, all the comments here, and I think I think both Higginson and and Stevens are correct. Thank you, Governor Knight. Um, Executive Administrator Bynum, did you have a comment about that? Oh, there I am. Uh, no, we certainly can work with uh, governors individually, and uh, whoever's having any technical issues, happy to set up some time. We can Zoom, and then. Um, uh, I'll make sure that it's, uh, I'll go through the files and make sure that those settings that I'm uploading and using, make, making sure that they're um, in this instance downloadable for everyone and just check the settings on, on the box that we have right now. And if you have any uh, challenges, please feel free to reach out to me directly. That's what I'm here for. Thank you, Executive Director, Executive Administrator. Ooh, I got a promotion. Okay. <laughs> Executive Director. <laughs> General Counsel Shankland. No. So, um, sorry, lots of noise in my background right now. Um, uh, so on the contract, the permissions that were provided were decided by the um, committee chair, not by anyone else. So perhaps what we also need is just some kind of an agreement among, you know, among all of you about what 
your expectations are when you are chairing committees and you're asking people to put materials in box, what, what is the expectation about the permissions? And, you know, is that something that the committee chairs should do? Um, so just saying there might be another piece here. Thank you, General Counsel Shanklin. Uh, again, uh, Governor William Ruth is your hand for this comment or, uh, okay. Uh, going back to you, Governor Higginson. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to bring up uh, is that, and I think Kyle, you were contacted by a member as well as one of our at-large governors, and I don't know which one, but one of the mem my members who lives in Anacortes had contacted me a while ago that she was not, uh, she had asked to have Bar News, the Bar News uh, publication mailed to her um, home address, but she, but the address she had listed in her member, in the member records was her business address, which I think a lot of people do list their business address because they don't really want clients to find out where they live at home and come angrily pound on their doors. It's happened to me once on Christmas Eve, but in a small town, people know where I live. Anyway, and she um, she was apparently given the information by um, someone that that was not possible. So I wondered if, and Sarah's on with us, maybe Sarah has some information about this and maybe this problem's already been resolved, but it brought up to me the question of, is it possible for us to ask us to us as members to designate an address that we want the bar news mailed to that's not necessarily the, ad the address for licensing purposes. Um, this member pointed out to me that with, with all the pandemic situation and a lot of people are working from home, so they're really not getting much mail at their office or it's hard to get to their office to get the mail. And that's where bar the bar news often lands. So it seemed like something maybe we ought to address and see if people can select a different address for mailing the bar news. But Correct. I wonder what thoughts people had. Maybe Correct. Sarah knows. Your request was, uh, her request, uh, you, you recalled incorrectly, she emailed me as well. And it seemed entirely reasonable. Um, and I believe Executive Director Nevitt was looking into it. I'd like to give an overview on sort of the issue and then I'll let Sarah talk about how we're sort of solving it in the short term. Um, because I also thought it was a very reasonable request. And yet as I got down the rabbit hole, I realized that there was a morass of court rules and privacy concerns that made it a little bit more complicated than it seemed. Um, the member had also pointed out that the Alaska Bar Association did it, so I had a call with the Alaska Bar Association's executive director. So we've definitely been looking into this. The main challenge, um, and, and one thing that I'm sure it will not surprise you to know, is that the publication of our member contact information is a very, very important issue to them. Uh, we get a lot of concerns and questions about privacy all the time. We are required by court rule uh, that the address, I believe it's on file. I think that's the language with the Bar Association or something like that. There's very vague language in several court rules referencing the address of uh, a member and how it has to be public. And the fact that it's worded so vaguely means that any address we collect we are at somewhat of a risk that it could be disclosed as public. And so that just makes it complicated. Um, in particular, if we put it in our database, if we store it differently, and, the, and for sure what we don't wanna do is inadvertently uh, expose someone's address that they don't wish to be exposed. So um, I'll turn it over to Sarah because I do think we resolved this issue in the narrow vein of the magazine, but it's an imperfect solution in terms of the administrative burden of it. Um, and I think it's possible, again, you know, if this is a real priority, it may require a court rule change or a bylaw change or something to clarify everything. Thank you, Executive Director Nevitt. Uh, Can I say for the short term that the, the Bar News team is really going through the very highly technical solution of uh, having a list of people who've requested it 
intercepting the official mailing list before it goes to the mail house, swapping out for the home addresses and notifying in a very clear way to those people that this is a change just for the magazine, not for regulatory purposes. But I just checked in with my team on that like Monday. And I know that, that I think that, that that is the plan going forward so that we can do it. The bigger question about self-serving for a bar magazine address is like our ultimate goal as well. That's very tricky. And right now we're in the middle of the pandemic. So our goal is that uh, we can just uh, honor those requests at least manually in the short term. Thanks, Chief Nagowski. All right, uh, hey. Governor Williams Roof. You're on mute, Governor Williams Roof. Um, on this issue regarding bar news, I uh, was wanting to know if it's possible for us to allow non-lawyers to purchase just a subscription to bar news so that they can see what's going on. Because I have a, a public member who has served the bar as a public member for decades, and it has been extremely difficult, and she still to this day does not get her own copy of Bar News, and she practically is almost one of those honorary lawyers given the impact she's had on the legal community. I feel for her. She's not getting her president's corner. We should get her her magazine. And we'll print off a stack of president's corners to get her the information. We're also looking, because this has been another thing as well, you know, we, we are very good at taking the members official mailing address and mailing them that magazine. Um, it's hard for us to build kind of those special side addendums. Uh, just last week, um, the Bar News team inquired, like with our storefront, into just making that like a product that you can go in and like purchase like other things. And we'd actually have that database. Because other than that, it's kind of a nebulous process. Um, will you connect with me on that name? Brent, and we will make sure that we get it. In the meantime, again, we've got a lot of like informal workarounds that I would really like to systematize so that we, you know, don't let people fall through the gaps. So in the short term, please do let me know, Brent, and I will promise we can get that person on the list. Um, and in the long term, we've had the same exact thought about just, I mean, putting it somewhere. It's a product, so we can do that as well. Thank you. Did I hear a hey from President-elect Tollefson? earlier did you have something no was it somebody else who wanted to, to have a comment regarding this not seeing any okay uh i've got governor williams ruth i've also seen governor stevens's hand come and go so governor williams ruth followed by governor stevens thank you mr president so unlike governor higginson this really is just a a comment for people to think about as we recruit for members of the Board of Governors. Um, earlier today, I talked about liaison shipping and how several of my liaison assignments were unaware that they even had liaisons. But that's not really an indictment for our fellow governors because I had my assistant add up all of my official meetings, and, and that doesn't include the numerous phone calls that I do with uh, various members of the staff or other governors, just the actual meetings and, and time, and, and again, the time I block out for preparing for the Board of Governors. And since January 1, I'm at 174 hours. And so I, I say this because um, I don't know that the public's ever heard or, or other parts of the association know that one of my big pet peeves is late materials, late, late materials, late, 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 super late, sorry, it's right before the meeting materials, and my request to President Shaketti to really crack down on that. And I was very much appreciative that we didn't have that situation today or, or for this meeting um, and I understand that everyone has things going on, but, and, and this isn't meant to be a woe is me, I'm a governor, you know, please be nice to us kind of thing, but just to understand that when we are serving the association in our maximum capacity, 
that we really are doing a lot and that we've got those meetings going on and that when things get delayed in your, in your world that then trickles up to us, that it makes it impossible to actually be prepared and have the type of robust, thorough debates, conversations and decision-making that we had at this meeting because so many people had that week time coming out. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, that, and, and because again, in all my conversations leading up to the decision to run for governor, there was no one that gave an even remotely close estimate of time associated with what it goes in to being a governor. And so I just think that as we are looking at revamping our orientation and how we orient people as they join and roll on to the board, that we keep in mind the like one of the things that, for example, one of the things that I said to Director Nevitt was that meetings at the end of the month as a solo and small practitioner who where the last day of the month and the last couple of days of the month is really about me working to get my invoices out for my clients, that it's really inconvenient to have 17 meetings in the last ca three calendar days of a month. And she'd said that nobody had ever mentioned that before. And so there's just a component to um, service that I, I wanted to say that again, serving as a governor has, has been one of my greatest honors and privileges, but realizing that it is coming at an extreme expense to my own practice and financial livelihood. So thank you again, I appreciate everyone's efforts in getting us materials timely and President Shaketi in, in, in helping me help everyone else, you know, make sure that we're prepared for our meetings. Thank you, Governor William Roof, and uh, more thanks goes to uh, Executive Administrator Bynum for that because she's done a wonderful job of trying to keep us on task and and getting the materials in. So thumbs up to um, to her. Uh, and you know when when I've done these these orientations with the new governors, um, it I've always said it kind of it depends, the amount of time depends on what you put into it. And I know Governor Williams Ruth puts in a lot of time. I know that Governor Clark, I just recently learned, does 140 hours a month, 140 hours a month. So that's an incredible uh, devotion of time. I hesitate to mention that to potential governors, because I remember back when I was thinking about running and Governor Resume said it was 80 hours, and that almost dissuaded me from volunteering. So if we told them it was 140 hours a month, I, I think we would lose some people. Um, but I do appreciate both you, Williams Ruth, and, and, and Governor Clark and others who put in that amount of time um, to this organization because it's, it's deeply appreciated and uh, the organization is better for it. Uh, all right. Uh, I've got, uh, I, I, Gov okay, let me back up here. Governor Stevens was next. Governor, uh, Executive Director Nevitt, did you have a comment about? Uh... Just, re just real quick, that I actually had the same conversation with the executive leadership team just a few days ago and pressing upon them how much I want to crack down on, on late items, late materials. And one, one little step that I asked them to take with the committees that they work with, and many of you are chairs of those committees, so I just wanted to flag it here, is as you go to set your committee meetings for next year, look at the BOG meeting schedule. <laughs> because if you have a committee meeting the week of the board meeting or even the week before the board meeting, there's literally no chance you're going to get your materials in on time. You're not gonna get your agenda item in on time. And so I think I really believe that we can do a much better job and, and by that I mean me and my team and that our whole, and then we collectively can do a better job of setting ourselves up for success um, so that, you know, we're not, because nobody wants to let their items go another month. Uh, but if we can schedule in advance, uh, keeping in mind those deadlines, that will help a lot. Thank you, Executive Director Nevitt. Uh, Pre President-elect Tolleson, do you have a comment on this topic? No, okay, then let's turn to Governor Stevens. So my, um... Right now, I'm gonna just let you know my uh, my stomach is churning because I told you I needed to 
give an apology. Um, and I am both embarrassed and, and kind of surprised by my own behavior. I am very mindful of the fact that when we governors talk, especially about staff and how we talk to staff, uh, it has a serious impact. And um, having been staff for, for many years with uh, boards, I'd like to believe I know how to comport myself. But sometimes you surprise yourself. And in the last diversity meeting where the subject matter came up regarding an item that we'll be taking up next month, the, uh, the election of governors, uh, out of my mouth at one point came a gratuitous statement that, well, you know, I don't want, I don't like having this calendar set up uh, 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 for, to, to accommodate staff. And I want to thank Diana Singleton because she uh, actually corrected me, but then we went on. Um, but you know, when you, when you put your foot in it, you, you know you kind of haven't done the right thing if you can't let it go. And I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let it go in terms of those things coming out of my mouth. And I even talked to Governor Angevel about it. So I, first of all, uh, am apologizing generally for that behavior. What I said was flat wrong, and I'm sorry. Uh, and by the way, this apology is going to be a three-time apology because I intend to go back to the diversity committee and actually apologize to the committee because what I said was wrong. And I'm also gonna to apologize to Paris Erickson because while I didn't call her by name, she's the person who was shepherding a lot of that work. And I owe her personally an apology. Um, and so uh, in, in the words of one of my favorite comedians, um, Jim Jeffries, he always ended his show saying, we can all do better. And when I make that kind of an error, I want to model the behavior I want to see for the rest of us. And so I give that apology. Um, I don't believe, I'd like to believe it doesn't reflect on how generally I I interact with the staff, but especially knowing that we have some serious issues that staff has raised in terms of their relationship with the board, it is absolutely important that when we make an error, when we do the wrong thing, that we clean it up and we give an apology. And so Governor Angevel, Diana, colleagues, I'm giving you my apology, but like I said, this is part one of three. Thanks. Thank you, Governor Stevens. I just mentioned that uh, we all have our moments, don't we? We all have strongly held um, positions and beliefs, and we're all passionate about what we're doing for the organizations. And sometimes, you know, maybe we don't speak um, as eloquently as we would like, um, but you know, my observation is we are working much better um, than we did just a few years ago with our staff, much better as teamwork, much better as a, a, a component of the whole. You know, we, while we may be guiding policy decisions, our staff, um, executive and otherwise, are actually putting that together. They're actually accomplishing what we envision, and we do that as a team. So the more the meetings that we can meet together with the staff and 
We're all on the same page. That's the way that we accomplish things. That's the way we think we get things done. It's not about keeping some people out of the meetings so that we can, you know, have other discussions and then, you know, have to tell three people in order to inform others about what we're doing. That's it just, it's inefficient. It's, it's, and it's not teamwork and it's not the way that I, 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 I see us best operating. So I appreciate those thoughts, uh, uh, Governor Stevens. Um, Governor Tollison. I'm sorry, President-elect Tollison. Father Governor Tollison to you. <laughs> judge, Judge Tollison. Former Judge Tollison too. <laughs> <laughs> all these former titles. Well, first of all, uh, I, one of the things that I just wanted to um, point out is the meeting schedules. And it, it would be really nice. I know that um, this is kind of a technical thing, but it would be really nice if all the meetings um, that are available for uh, the members of the board got populated to those Outlook calendars. I find, you know, thank heavens for Outlook. Because <laughs> I can just look at my Outlook calendar. Oh, I've got this meeting. I got this meeting. I get, but some of the meetings don't show up. Um, and it would really be great if, if just, you know, all the meetings that um, President Schichetti was talking about that I would like to uh, try to attend as many of as possible, um, kind of immediately got populated to, uh, to Outlook. So I didn't have to go looking throughout the Bar Association website, which is a great website, but it's got a tremendous amount of information that you've got to navigate through to get to where you want to go. Um, the reason I had my hand up is just to um, thank all the members of the board of governors and thank all the employees of our association for their continued dedication to this organization. And uh, how do I know that? Because of what I think with very few hiccups has been a wonderful transition uh, to having to work remotely uh, during the pandemic. Um, there, I'm sure there've been hiccups that I don't even know about, um, but uh, from my perspective, the, the organization and all the employees have just worked as really, really hard to, to keep um, this organization doing its critical functions for our members and for the public. And so I just want to make sure everybody knows that I'm paying attention to all this stuff. My, I may not have my camera on all the time. I, I think I said earlier today that I was working remotely in Seattle. And if you want to get an idea of what my remote workspace is, I'm not going to show it to you. But uh, my desk is a is two sawhorses and a piece of quarter inch uh, plywood, with uh, with a computer that I uh, last fired up in November of 2020. Believe it or not, it came to life. <laughs> but um, you folks have just been tremendous. The members of the board have been tremendous. Uh, we are working better, I think, than um, than past boards that I've been a part of. And uh, congratulations, and let's keep up the good work. Thanks, President-elect Tollison. I just make the comment that my father, the treasurer of Spokane for some 20 years, uh, worked off of cinder blocks and an old door as his desk. <laughs> <laughs> you make do. All right. Uh, Adm Executive Administrator Bynum, do you have a, a comment? I do. I don't think I've ever spoken this much in a meeting before. In response to uh, President-elect Tolson, uh, thank you for those comments. That's really appreciated. And I, I understand uh, the technology challenges as we've had a couple of old school phone calls recently. Um, to address your comment about the meetings on uh, Outlook and getting those directly to your inbox. We actually do have an initiative that started at an executive committee meeting um, a couple of months ago now where um, each of you, the governors, will be able to opt in to email communications to, to get those um, invites into your inbox for the different board committees. So that is coming. Let's hope for next week. We got a few things uh, ahead of that, but uh, that is in the works. Thank you, Executive Administrator Bynum. I also comment that uh, uh, 
broadcast service manager Rex Nolte mentioned to me that this was the first time that he really got to speak about any uh, substantive uh, matter on uh, the Board of Governors. And uh, I think this has been great. We should do more of this. We should have more of our staff talking to us and interacting with us because uh, I think that serves many, many youth youthful purposes for us and not excluding others. Uh, Governor Abel, you uh, had a busy day today. I know you missed part of our uh, discussion. I wanted to turn to you, turn it over to you for your uh, Governor Roundtable part. I, I did miss part of the discussion. I apologize for that, Mr. President. Thank you for calling on me. Uh, my time away from the meeting was not entirely misspent, though, because I was able to locate my bog pin. So good news there. Um, a quick question, actually. For Governor Grubicki, um, I don't know, PJ, if you've already gone, um, if you have or if you have not, did you plan on talking about the rural practice group? I haven't talked about it yet. Um, that's a group that um, both uh, Hunter and I serve on. Um, and we have we've now enlisted um, the uh, hands on help of uh, a bunch of the admissions staff at uh, all three law schools. Um, I think that I think we are probably 80 or 90 percent of the way um, through identifying um, a program for um, uh, promoting uh, rural practice. Um, I think we've identified that um, uh, in recruiting uh, kids to become rural practitioners, um, you probably need to um, focus on kids that were raised in, in a rural atmosphere. You're not going to get somebody who was raised in Tacoma and get them to come to Davenport, Washington. Um, but there are a lot of kids out there that are um, in the pipeline in law school that come from rural backgrounds. And at least in eastern Washington, which, where I have experience and can talk about, um, there are a number of very lucrative practices out there with practitioners who are in their 60s or even in their early 70s who are getting ready to retire and have nobody to turn the practice over to. Um, and um, we need to deal with that or we're gonna end up with um, a bunch of uh, towns and a bunch of counties um, without resident attorneys. Um, and so that's really what we're focused on. And um, both Hunter and I um, have um, experience with um, Eastern Washington. Um, and so that's where we've talked a lot, um, but we need to do the same thing in Western Washington as well in the rural counties. Um, and if we don't do it, we're gonna have a crisis in terms of access to lawyers um, in the years to come. And the sad thing about this is, as I said, um, the economic opportunities there in a number of these um, towns are really quite nice. Um, it's, it's just a matter of matching the um, kids with rural experience with that. So we've talked about um, talking to uh, kids in high school about um, opportunities in the law, talking to kids in college um, uh, and having programs with them to talk to them about opportunities in the law and rural law and identify uh, kids in each one of those situations that have a rural background and target them. And then working with the um, admission staff at the three universities, three law schools, um, identifying um, kids from rural backgrounds as they start to come into um, the law school programs and trying to point them towards the opportunities that are out there. The other challenge is um, a lot of these uh, folks are solo practitioners. And they'll say, well, I can't take the risk of paying some kid right out of law school $70,000 or $60,000 or whatever the number is going to be uh, and hope that it all works out. Um, I'm 68 years old. I'm not going to take that risk by myself. So we've talked about, well, is there a way that we can give them, um, maybe uh, get the legislature to give them some B&O tax relief to the extent that they do that? Um, is there a way that we can find some sort of relief um, for the kids, for their student debt, um, if they, you know, spend their first 10 years in a rural practice, because then they'll stay. We're looking at all of those sorts of things um, and um, uh, trying to get over the goal line. And I think we're getting closer and closer. 
We're going to have a series of workshops on uh, March the 22nd and 23rd at noon, where we um, uh, talk about this again and talk to some rural pr practitioners and see how far we can get. Hunter, what would you add to that? You know, th thanks, BJ. That covers a lot of it. What I really wanted to do was just um, update the Board of Governors on this and highlight a few things. One, you know, this issue, this rural practice group has been uh, moving forward now for, for some time and originated with some efforts by the uh, Washington Young Lawyers uh, Division. Um, and there's been sustained interest and leadership in this, both from um, Governor uh, Grubicki, um, Governor Angelil, and former Governor Swiegel. Um, but we've been really invaluably uh, supported by on the staff side by Julianne Unite and Kevin Plachy. And I'm pretty excited about where we're headed on this. Um, the further we dig into this, the more we look at this, the more we find that this really is an area of um, rich potential for the profession uh, here in Washington, as well as for this organization. Um, we've got a number of uh, proposed solutions or rather um, potential answers to some of the questions we've been looking at. And I anticipate that in the near future, um, representatives from the rural practice uh, group are going to come before this board with a request to establish uh, a standing WSBA committee um, uh, addressing this issue, a rural practice committee. Um, one thing I would say is that this is low hanging fruit for our organization to build bridges with practitioners in areas where frankly, they don't like a lot of what they hear from us. And this has already um, created significant positive inroads for our organization. You know, I'm hearing from uh, lawyers in, you know, counties um, that are, uh, I'll just say this, it's not where the vast majority of our members are at, um, but they are people, they are members who are very pleased um, that this issue is being addressed. Uh, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens as this as on um, this as it develops and goes forward. So um, thanks to Governor Grabicki, Governor Angelville, um, and former Governor Spiegel is done here, but as well as the staff also for their leadership on that. Um, the only other item I have, um, Mr. President, is uh, this was already addressed previously, but I just really want to encourage all of the, my fellow governors to beat the bushes for APEX nominations. Um, there's been an extension. Um, as you all know, I don't have to tell you, this is one of the highlights of the year. This is great, right? This is one of the reasons we all want to be very much involved in this organization is the chance to congratulate and thank the leaders in our profession. Um, so get those in. We've got a couple of, I think it was extended until March 31st. Use that time wisely. Let's have a bunch of nominations. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Governor Abel and Governor Grubicki. I, you know, just one comment on uh, rural practice. I think the the most effective way of getting that off the ground would be to create a TV series where you have a young attorney from Seattle who gets assigned to Davenport, where he has to practice law in order to repay the uh, the state of Washington for his law school tuition. That would be, you know, Northern Exposure Two. That would be the the, the best way of uh, promoting that. It, it could right. turn into Twin Peaks in a hurry. There, there you go. <laughs> All right. I am not seeing any other hands uh, raised virtually. Any other actual raised hands? Not seeing any on my two screens. So with that, I think we had a very successful meeting. I always like the fact that we don't end up screaming, yelling, calling each other names. It's always a successful meeting. And uh, I think we've had some very good spirited discussions of uh, issues that maybe we don't all agree with, but I think we did keep it all very civil and all, um, all within the good of the organization and the best interests of our members. So I congratulate everybody for that. And it's for almost 420. And so that's pretty good getting out early. Uh, I will go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting and look forward to seeing you all in April. I, oops, I saw Governor Stevens. Did you want to make one last comment? No, I was just going to move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Great. I think that the consensus is that's unanimous. We'll go ahead and do that and see you next month. Thanks, all.